Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Fatma Sajwani. I am a general dentist, an oral surgeon, and uh, a pas have a passion for the outdoors. And I'm here today, and I'm very happy and honored to talk to, to you about inspiring women, Arab men women specifically, in climbing and mountaineering fields. What brings me here today is to talk about the females, the part of society that makes the most important uh, task. And uh, it's very important to encourage them and inspire them into outdoor mountaineering fields with confidence and passion. I am here mainly today to talk about my story, my journey through the mountaineering fields, the climbing, the summits, all of it. And uh, I would like to talk about why I chose the mountains, why exactly there, and what the mountains have taught me through the years, and also the life lessons gained in that time. And also in the end, I would like to highlight the challenges faced by Arab women in the mountains and expeditions. I would like to first thank and uh, give all the uh, thank and the support from our rulers and readers from who have supported ladies from all walks of life in all the fields in sports and uh, career-wise. Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan al Nahyan, our late founding father, has said, we do not only empower women, but we empower women through the community. And that's what I'm trying to do here. I would like to empower our next generation, the females, the girls who are trying to go on to adventures and big sports, extreme sports, to that. So they would like to go there with confidence and knowing that somebody in the past has already done it, giving them the courage and the adventurous spirit to go forward. At first, I would like to speak about myself and give you a little bit of a background about me. I started oral surgery three years ago. My training started and with all the passion that I have for it. It was very important for me to go through a field that was inspiring and filled with adventure and new. And somehow, luckily for me, it was already a uh, men-controlled <coughs> environment. It's all me men who are working in the uh, field. And for me to embark on that adventure, which was itself very challenging for me. And now, three years later, I can say that I am in a department which is not only <coughs> uh, controlled by men anymore. Second of all, I would like to uh, tell you that I have started indoor climbing from a passion of one time. I went once for climbing, and instead of coming back again, I decided to make a six-month membership. And that's where the passion for indoor climbing started. I am also a, a vid traveler, and uh, I have passion for exploring and traveling the world. And finally, my most, uh, my biggest achievement, climbing the Aconcagua mountain at almost 7,000 meters in Argentina uh, two years ago. Well, first of all, I would like to talk about where the passion started, where the journey has begun. Uh, after almost one year of climbing, in the UAE locally, uh, my best friend and I decided to suddenly just take it one level up and go for the Kilimanjaro. Uh, it was our second trip abroad. I mean, for two girls who have never embarked on a trip abroad, that was one big plan. With no experience at all, no, not in training, we had no idea what altitude sickness is, what to expect from a trip in five days of camping. And uh, there we go. And I told that I remember telling my mom that I'm going to do the same hiking I do here, but in Tanzania. Really disregarding the fact that it's a thousand meters high. So that was in uh, February 2018, where the passion started. And uh, alhamdulillah, uh, Kilimanjaro was uh, summited. And here is my second, uh, or second mountain. My friend and I decided to go for the second one without any training, of course, maybe a little bit more physical and mental fitness, but we decided to embark on a different adventure this time. It is in a different condition, in a snowy <coughs> mountaineering and more dangerous uh, Elbrus Summit, which is the highest in Europe and Asia. Uh, so this one was summited in July 2018, and uh, the amount of passion and 
learning and the skills that were gained on this mountain were just unbelievable. We learned how to struggle together as two friends. In the mid midway, and I think four hours before the summit, I had to leave my friend because she had blindness, temporary blindness, and she suffered with dizziness and couldn't walk. I had to leave her in tears and <laughs> going down the mountain herself with a guy that doesn't even speak English for me to go up and raise our flag. And that year we were raising the year of Zaid flag and the Emirati flag. And I had to go by myself and do that. I had, had no idea if she had survived the condition that she was in, only to meet her down in the base camp uh, fine and well uh, six hours later when I came down after the summit. I am very proud of the summit because I learned from Kilimanjaro, so I trained for this one. I had checked all the boxes when it comes to altitude sickness and mountaineering for this one. I had hydrated, I trained very well, I trained the right muscles in the right times, and I summited this one without any altitude sickness, unlike Kilimanjaro, where I had stomach pain, nausea, and dizziness in the end. And there you go, this is the mountain that I want to speak a lot about. This is one of my biggest achievements, and one that, if there is a mountain that has changed me or an experience in my life that made me who I am today, it will be this mountain. This is Aconcagua, and uh, with this one, you get the bragging rights. This is at 7,000 meters almost, uh, the highest uh, summit in the northern and western hemispheres and uh, South America. For this one, I was heavily engaged in uh, oral surgery training, and I realized that NIMS had made an announcement on Instagram that they are taking amateurs and uh, beginner climbers to Aconcagua. NIMS himself will be there. And I couldn't help it. I just registered the same day and paid the amount. That was only one month before the expedition starts. And it was a bit of a pickle because I was not really trained. I was just fit, but not trained for a mountain uh, this high or this demanding. And then two weeks before that mountain, I hesitated and emailed in case they would give me back my money and I can just cancel everything. And they told me it's possible. And then I took a week leave at home and started thinking about it. I convinced myself to go for this mountain with three points. I convinced myself that if there is someone crazy and adventurous enough to do it, it has to be me. I don't know anyone who would go with me, actually. And the second thing, I only know two local girls, Emirati girls, who have done this mountain. That makes me the third one. And that was just a fire within. I couldn't shut that down until I do that mountain, or at least attempt it. And the third thing was how much regret I will be having if I did not summit this mountain, or at least attempt it in some way. And I'm really happy that I attempted this mountain because two weeks after I came back, the lockdown started. And I haven't seen the inside of a flight for a year and a half. So I'm glad that this is the last thing that happened before COVID started, Concagua. And of course, it had a very big impact on me mentally. I was not mentally fit before I go. I hesitated so much and I thought, I have never done it before. I have never tra traveled across the globe to South America, a place I have never been before in my life, alone, to meet people that I have never climbed with in my life, I have never met them, and to do a mountain that I have never seen or known about. It's just, I have only read about this mountain. So when it comes to this mountain, this is the one where I say, if, if you have done a Concagua, you can do whatever you set your mind to. This is the one, this is the one that keeps me always fighting for more, whether career-wise or any mountain after this one. Of course, the challenge here was, as an Arab female tra traveling with uh, non-Arabs, the big challenge was the privacy, the, uh, the personal space. I had to live in, a, in the base cap in Plaza de Mulas in a dom, uh, uh, dom uh, tent, which has about eight to nine people mixed. That was the biggest challenge for me, staying two to three weeks in the base camp. That was the biggest challenge to me, honestly. It was an invasion of personal space. It's as an Arab and a Muslim woman, it was very, very confining and I felt very um, claustrophobic being living in the same place for about two weeks. 
And the other challenge was in this mountain that we had to stay one more week in the base camp doing nothing but eating and sleeping and having fun because the weather window was not yet open and we had to wait for the weather to get better. So that's Plaza de Mulas in the camp, base camp at 4,300 meters. This is me on the summit push. And that one on the far right is the uh, camp one at 5,050 meters high. And this one has, this small tent has three people inside of it. I was lucky to have two more amazing la ladies with me in that tent. And uh, that's for the, I mean, the, to make the heat in the tent, there has to be more people in the tent. And I had to accept that because it was too late to change. And uh, they appear to be amazing ladies with me. And then this is the best picture of all. This is me with Nims, the legend, the one who climbed 8,000 meters, the 14, 8,000 meters mountains in the world with the best timing. OK, it's time to talk about how the mountains changed me. I grew up in a conservative family, just like most of the girls here in the UAE, a conservative family who is very well protective and traditional. I come from also a slightly religious family who do not believe in girls just traveling abroad, uh, going for three weeks on mountaintops with no relatives or guys with them. But I had to do it. I had to get the third mountain done. And uh, this changed me in many ways. I happened to be the last kid in the house. I'm the spoiled one, the one who got everything ready, the one who had her food cooked, her clothes cleaned her dishes done, everything. I have never traveled alone abroad for a long time. Yes, I am dependent, but when it comes to the small stuff, it was a challenge to grow up, to actually mature and do my things myself and uh, prepare everything, to know my responsibilities, the small ones and the big ones. Well, first of all, what I learned from these three mountains, I mean, the growth that happened through three mountains of traveling alone and the big responsibility that I have to stay safe, healthy, and well uh, through them. What helped me so much was the growth from these mountains to help me to prepare. These pictures are from uh, the last trip in June with Mr. Arno here. And uh, in this trip, I was thinking, I, have, I had only, I think, four to six weeks short notice to know how to prepare for such a trip. And uh, knowing that I have to carry my backpack, which is something that I have not done in the last trips that I have done on mountains. I have, we have always had porters to carry our stuff. We had always support. I only carried my own backpack and walked. So that's all I've done. In this one, however, the change was that I had to carry all of my stuff in my bag and put it on my back and walk with it through inclines, mountains, and the whole thing. So. I am very proud to say that after this trip that I have learned and have grown through the, my adventures. I have, alhamdulillah, packed all of my stuff, the tent, the mat, the sleeping bag, to the small stuff, the toiletries, and the food. And I made a promise to myself that I will carry everything on my back and I will never lend someone to carry anything for me. And I was blessed enough <laughs> to carry everything, alhamdulillah, go through that six days of camping trip and come back. So uh, I'm happy that climbing the highest in South America was not worth the clap, but this one is, and I agree with you. <laughs> the amount of training, the weight training that this one took was really worth it. I am, uh, I'm very proud of this achievement, although it's a small, uh, just a six days trekking trip took me six weeks of preparation. And this is what the adventures have taught me. Whatever the plan is, how small the project is, preparation is very important. It's very important to prepare for everything, the food, the diet, every small stuff that you cannot find on the mountains that you have to bring with you. The clothes, how much clothes, how much do you get cold? You have to remember, you have to know yourself enough to know how to pack without needing anything from anyone else. I mean, even the liquids, the, the beanies, the everything, one thing forgotten is a big problem. And that responsibility you gain through adventure, through traveling alone, through embarking on adventures and taking it all on yourself. And I'm proud that this has to happen through very three difficult mountains. So uh, part of the preparation is physical. And uh, 
in most mountains, you have to know which muscles, which weakness in you that you have to uh, prepare. And uh, <clears throat> mostly in this trip, it was the lower body. I had to really strengthen my lower body to avoid injuries and uh, put on the weights and walk with it for long hours. Secondly, it was the mental. And the mental really, the mental toughness is very, very important. The fortitude has to be really compatible with the adventure that is coming. I mean, when I was in Aconcagua for one week in the base camp, all that I had to do is keep the positive thoughts, to know that to keep this mental toughness all the way to the summit. Because day by day, away from family, away from your favorite foods, away from your bed, the pet, the mom, the family, the friends, everything, including also internet. I did not have internet for two weeks in Aconcagua. And that itself is an achievement. Uh, all of that help, helps to keep your mental toughness there reliable and all the way to keep you up to the summit. If I was a little bit mentally weak, I wouldn't have done it. I have seen two people who just climbed down Camp 2 with fake symptoms of altitude sickness that was not there, with us complaining and telling them it's like it's not there, they can do it, but it's all in the head after all. And finally, the gear. The gear is very important. And I remember buying three bags till I got to this bag, the one I really felt comfortable with, and uh, decided to take it with me there. The gear is very important. You have to take your comfortable shoes, your comfortable trekking uh, gear with you. And this is what selection comes to play. I mean, selecting too many things on too many trips really tells you that one good piece of gear is better than three. And this is something you gain through adventure, this confidence in yourself and selection, this matters the most. Second of all is the resilience to be very strong and tough inside that you are capable to tolerate all the uncomfortableness that can be found on the mountain. This is Plaza de Molas. It is the second uh, largest base camp in the world after the base camp of Everest. And it's dry, windy, sometimes snowy, and it's very, very, very cold. The temperatures might reach when I was there to minus 10 in the night. We would wake up in frozen uh, sleeping bags. And that's only the base camp. We have not even went to camp one or two. The second picture here is sunset at camp one. This is the time that we reached after a long hike up a hike up that somehow I got affected by the altitude and had stomach and back, lower back pain, which was clearly altitude because it was completely gone when I came back the, down the mountain and to the city. It was very tough to do this uh, trek up, the, up, up Camp 1 because I knew that if, I, if this pain continues, if this weakness is there, I will not summit. And this was two weeks before the summit. And the resilience that I had, the company that I had, and us encouraging each other to go up there was very, very important to me. I just kept silent, kept to myself, and promised myself that I'm here for a reason, and God would not take me all the way up here for no reason. And then I have to put one step in front of the other and try to do my best. And this way of thinking is what took me to the summit. I was scrambling to the summit. I was way up in pain in my lower back, and somehow I had no breathing problems, but I was very, very, very sleepy. I could sleep if I actually sit on any rock. That was my altitude sickness. This is how it was very clear that I had it. Alhamdulillah, it was already summited, but <laughs> it was very, very tough. Uh, third thing that the mountain told me is stepping out of the comfort zone. This picture here is the hike up Camp 1. And... All what I was waiting for us is the soup. I don't remember how it tasted. I'm not sure it tasted very good. I'm glad that I don't remember, but this is all we had. I mean, this was the first thing we've done. We just unzipped our boots. Those boots, by the way, are about two to three kgs high, uh, heavy. So that was the first thing I've done is have the soup. There is no your favorite food. There is nothing that I want to eat at this moment. It's just the soup and the long nap. And this is very much the discomfort that I was in. And said that the days you are most uncomfortable are the days you learn the most about yourself. And this is exactly the purpose. This is exactly the reason I am here. 
to talk about being in the discomfort zones is what teaches us about ourselves. We do not learn much when we are at comfort in our homes. This is exactly why I love the mountains. It takes me out of my discomfort zone. And then I get to meet myself and how strong I am and how capable I am. And the second picture is in Elbrus. This is one of the hikes that we have done, acclimatization hikes, to get used to the altitude. We go up and we, then we go down. And I remember washing those dishes with frozen hands. That water was really cold. And this is something that has to be done after each meal, going to wash the dishes, actually walking for five to 10 minutes to the stream to wash the dishes. This is something that my mom would really be surprised to see, but this is how you grow up out of your environment in the mountains. You become someone that you are not. You are someone dependent on yourself now. And uh, to do it happily without complaints is the point. And this is what I loved about being outdoors with friends. You are happy about the tasks and the chores that you have to do, including washing clothes or washing dishes or cooking the food. And finally, the challenges facing Arab girls in the outdoors within considering myself or other girls are the following. First of all, it's the privacy. The privacy is very important. And it's really annoying when you find that you cannot take, change your clothes or comb your hair or be just yourself alone. And that's very, very mentally challenging. So that, to do that and do it for a month in base camps like Everest Base Camp to do the big mountains in the Himalayas, this is my next challenge personally. And I would like to actually challenge myself to be in a way in that uh, situation without feeling uncomfortable. Second of all is the cultural norms and traditions. We are not living in a country where girls would go on mountains and uh, unfortunately that's not the tradition, that's not a cultural norm. When we came back from Elbrus two years ago, three years ago, we were in the news because we raised that year of Zaid flag and the main problem was for me is that it was all over news suddenly and they announced it as two dentists who went up uh, the top of Russia. And among all the good comments that we had, all the encouragement from the society and the community that we have done a very nice job and made them proud, we, there was still a fraction of these comments that were about why are dentists up there, why aren't you in the clinic, why are the girls now doing the mountains, you should be at home. And this is the main reason we keep doing, we keep pushing for mountains. We can, we, I want to push girls to do any sports they want, there is no gender in sports. You can do whatever you can, whatever you want, and staying in the limits of social decency. And the last thing is the personal space. As I talked before, personal space is very important and it's very difficult to explain that to other uh, nationalities or people from other cultures, that we are Muslims, that we are Arabs, and we would not like to be very close or very uh, that personal space should not be invaded. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to explain that to uh, other national guys and girls actually from other nationalities who do not really understand that they have not lived in that community or society to understand or respect personal space. And that was one of the biggest challenges for me in Aconcagua because it was multicultural from, I mean, we are climbing from with guys from all over the world. And it sounds rude to ask for that personal space, but in the same time, that is your right. It is tough. You have to be very confident and a strong personality to actually fight for that right. I do not, and I like to say it, I, if you do not like to be hugged or do not like to be close to someone, you have to actually say it and fight for it because that's your right, that's your culture. And girls feel that pressure. And it's very, very evident. And this is what I am here to say, that it is okay. It is very normal that you fight for what you believe in, for your beliefs, for what you are raised to be and still climb those mountains and summit them. So my, my motto in life is never stop chasing your summits. I have also many career summits that I still am working on. Th those are my mountains. And I would like to encourage girls everywhere to go on, embark, and fight for what they believe in, whether it's extreme sports, mountaineering, racing, cycling, or any other sports there. They have to fight for it and they have to do it. If it's done by men, that means it's possible. And if it's possible, then it's possible to be done by ladies. There is no rule that says it cannot be. And the 
reason I am here is to say if they want to do it, then I'm here telling all the ladies and Arabs there that it has been done, so it's possible. Thank you so much for listening.